Iranian protests following the death of Masa Amini, who died in police custody after not wearing a hijab, have passed the two-month mark. And they seem to show no signs of stopping, both in Iran and around the world. Hundreds of protests, often spearheaded by young women, have been organized around Iran, often at a cost, as approximately 400 protesters have been detained by Iranian law enforcement for their attempts to try and dismantle the Iranian regime and protect women's rights. And now, the protests are spreading. Two influential Iranian actresses were arrested and protests have taken place in beach football, water polo, and basketball, whilst Iran's national soccer team chose not to sing their country's anthem before their opening World Cup match against England. So where do the protests go from here? Will the Khamenei regime remain strong? Or is this the beginning of the end? How long can these protests last for? And when will they come to an end? Which side will be happiest? Could gestures on a global sporting and cultural stage have an impact? What's next for the Iranian protests? So let's get to it. What is next for the Iran protest? As always, we begin with a quick fire round of 30 seconds each to lay out your initial stance and we dig in uh, deeper uh, right after. Miriam and Marcia Degi, please take the lead. Well, protesters uh, in Iran are more united than ever. Uh, throughout the country, um, they call each other's names. So there is a massacre in Mahabad. Uh, people in Tehran and other cities throughout the country say, we are all Mahabad now. We are all uh, behind you. Um, the unity is also uh, readily apparent in the diaspora, in opposition leaders outside of the country, all in one voice calling for wholesale removal of the regime and uh, it's incumbent upon yes uh, we will put a stop right here and uh, continue in a split second Barbara Slavin your thoughts uh, it's Barbara Slavin but that's Sorry, okay my apologies. Um, I don't I don't disagree with uh, Mariam at all I think these are unprecedented protests I think that they're uh, much more than protests against the enforced hijab uh, people are really seeking a change, a major change in the system that has governed them for the last uh, 43 years. And every death brings more protests. 40 days later, uh, a memorial service. Uh, so they will continue. The protests will continue for sure. Last and, uh, but not uh, least, that's for sure. Benham Ben Talablu, your thoughts? Thank you so much. A pleasure to be with you in the studio. Uh, in short, you know, past is going to be prologue here. The, you know, the mm -hmm. protests are set to continue. They've already hit over 140 different cities. They've already hit every single one of Iran's 31 different provinces. Uh, and ultimately, if that protest power in the future on the streets is married with future strike power, in particularly in key sectors, you could have a repeat of history where time and the economy are moved from this side of the state to the side of the street. So, I mean, that will be one major indicator of success for the protesters uh, moving forward. But right now, in the short term, I'd expect more celebrity amplification and hopefully more international support. And uh, from this point onwards, uh, please uh, feel free to interact, uh, dear uh, panelists. And before we uh, look uh, perhaps uh, uh, um, more inwards in what is happening uh, um, uh, domestically at Islamic Republic, Tehran is accusing the West of, uh, of meddling. Uh, do they have a point, Benham? No. So no, the, they the, don't the, have a point. Oh, did you say yeah. Batam or, or Mariam? My apologies. Uh, it doesn't matter. Mariam, take the lead, ladies Mariam, first, please. right? Yes. The regime has been saying this uh, since it's been, been in power. Since the revolution, it has tried to blame outside forces uh, for the dissent of the Iranian people. And it has tried to uh, maintain its power by uh, executing uh, people who stand for freedom, by torturing them. And really, it, its policy towards uh, the revolutionaries today is just an extension of what it's done for 43 years. Um, uh, Barbara Slavin says that she is uh, agreeing with me, but it's uh, if, if she is agreeing with me, it's very, very new, because for a long time, people like her in Washington have talked about how reform and uh, from within and dialogue with this regime are the only ways forward. But the people on the, on the streets of Iran are speaking unmistakably 
uh, for what is the only solution to a totalitarian regime, and that is uh, regime change. It's now incumbent upon the United States to listen to the people of mm. Iran and not to um, it, uh, lobbyists for the regime outside of the country who um, are pressing for renewed negotiations with the regime. Ms. Lavin just recently sat down for dinner uh, me, with I the respond? president. Let, let's allow, let's allow uh, Barbara Slavin to. I think yeah. I have a right to respond. Of course, of course. Um, I think that my views have been reflecting those of people inside Iran for a very, very long time, whereas Mariam reflects the views of a slice of the diaspora. May I remind people that Iranians were supportive of diplomacy under the previous government of Hassan Rouhani. The situation has changed. Donald Trump, at the advice of people like Mariam, quit the Iran nuclear deal in 2018, restored all the sanctions, and helped plunge Iranians into complete hopeless poverty and despair. The government in charge now, that of Ibrahim Raisi, is incredibly brutal, repressive, inept, and corrupt. So why and it did offers you sit no down respect. with him? Offers why no did you sit down with him, change. Barbara? But you can't rewrite history. In the past, Iranians in Iran supported diplomacy. Why did you sit there down with Ray? Pardon there is me? no Iran law. We're having some no connectivity uh, um, uh, miscommunication here. Benham, you're listening uh, to those, uh, I wouldn't say uh, counter or arguments, but uh, perhaps a different uh, illustrations of how things uh, uh, unfolded. But where do, do we stand at this point in time? Uh, again, we can't deny the fact that uh, the West is not uh, shedding any tears uh, watching uh, what's currently unfolding in the Islamic Republic. Well, well, with respect to what the uh, you know government of the Islamic Republic has been doing, you know this is a tried and true tactic in the authoritarian playbook to point a finger abroad uh, for problems that they themselves have created at home. And you really saw this in 2017 and 2018, and a crescendo of the same slogans in those protests coming through in the current uh, iteration of protests. And they usually Iranians will go in front of government buildings, parliament buildings, uh, you know, <clears throat> sites affiliated with the government of the Islamic Republic, and they will chant, and they have chanted. Did. Our enemies here, they lie when they say it's in America. And when they have done this, and when they continue to do this, it is actually myth-busting that foreign support, Western support, American support, whoever's support would be the kiss of death for the Iranian people. I think the Iranian people are loudly and proudly, despite having coming from very diverse political, ethnic, sectarian, religious backgrounds, they have all suffered at the hands of the Islamic Republic, and they have all in unison seen the brutality of this regime kill uh, a young 22-year-old uh, Iranian Kurdish woman and that is why, despite the different backgrounds and baggage, everyone inside the country, the Kurd, Persian, Arab, Turk, Lur, whatever ethnic and sectarian background, has seen this the same way. And that is why protests have hit big city, capital city, uh, you know, provincial city, rural yeah. town and village, and is very widespread. But this authoritarian playbook of pointing a finger abroad is proof that they actually see these protests uh, as not, you know, an economic protest or a hijab protest or a social protest or whatnot, these have been and are systemic, nationalist, anti-regime protests that the regime fears. And so it's time that we read these protests correctly, see where they have connectivity and contrast with past iterations of Iranian protests, and take our cues from the street of yeah. how properly to stand with and support the Iranian people. But uh, Benham describing uh, um, uh, Western support as a kiss of death, uh, so to speak, but on the flip side of it, will international no, no, pressure... I'm, I'm, I'm not... I'm not. I'm not saying it's the kiss of death. The regime has tried yeah, to sell yeah, it yeah. in my the past. Yeah, as a yeah, kiss yes, of, death. of course, of course. My apologies, uh, but um, my point being that on the flip side of it, maybe rising international uh, pressure will only make uh, Iran more aggressive. For example, drive it closer into uh, uh, to Russia, as the Israeli uh, intelligence chief warning some provocation at the World Cup event in in, in Qatar. Not to speak about the nuclear uh, option, which is advancing by the second, according to the. IA chief uh, uh, this very evening, uh, uh, Barbara. Yeah, no, I think that uh, there is a way to show solidarity and support. We can't take away the agency of the Iranian people. We can't substitute for the Iranian people. And those who think that military strikes on Iran now would be helpful should get their heads examined, because I think that's the one thing that actually Who's would help. The Who's calling uh, for military strikes? 
must see other Mujahid called for that uh, in an she gave in Canada, and I think that would be a terrible That's idea. Can help the herring. people every way we can to communicate with each other, to communicate with the outside world, to give them stable internet, to give them circumvention. So we know what is happening. We can amplify and we can work through uh, agencies to uh, investigate and hold accountable those responsible for the worst abuses. The UN is having a major meeting on Thanksgiving mm -hmm. Day on the 24th. Uh, we should support that. There should be a special mechanism to investigate Iran's abuses. And of course, we can sanction individuals within the country who are associated with the crackdown. This is what we should be doing. <coughs> Mariam. The most important thing that needs to be done is for the recommendations of people like Barbara, uh, who for decades now have recommended that reformists in the country be supported. Um, people like Barbara have taken smiling selfies with Javad Azari for Lari Jani, or just recently Barbara sat down Here's with the president Here's of Raisi, personally culpable for the Here's massacre of thousands in 1988. Only a few weeks ago, Barbara had this meeting with President oh, yes, Raisi, who is now responsible. What did I do? I confronted him yes. about Asa Amini. Are you really? You, you misunderstand. The reason that, the reason that people are so completely. angry at people who are still willing to sit down with this regime is because a totalitarian regime that is brutally torturing and killing people as they rise up for freedom is not going to be uh, amenable to change via diplomacy. Yeah, well, I don't think you have the best credibility on this issue either, my dear. Well, uh, let's Why try uh, to uh, refrain from ad hominem uh, claims. I'm, I'm sure that uh, all those involved are, 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 are acting out of the best uh, possible intentions and in incentives. The uh, modus operandi might be uh, slightly uh, different. Okay, on that note, we will be taking a short uh, break now, but when we get back, uh, we uh, dive uh, into, uh, we, we, we go rather uh, to Qatar, uh, to the unprecedented uh, Iranian uh, protest uh, there. So a few minute break and we're back with the rest of the summit. Welcome back uh, to the summit. Still with us, uh, Barbara Slavin, uh, Mariam uh, Marsadegi, and Ben and Ben Blue. Thank you all very much uh, for staying with us. We're also staying on topic, but before we dive back into the conversation, uh, let's take a listen to the Iranian uh, soccer captain uh, from earlier today, right before his teammates uh, decided not to sing the national anthem at the uh, Qatar World Cup. Let's take a listen. I would like to express my condolences to all bereaved families in Iran. They should know that we are with them. We support them and we sympathize with them. We have to accept that the situation in our country is not good and that our people are not happy. They are discontent. We are here, but it does not mean we should not be their voice or that we should not respect them. Whatever we have is theirs. We are here to work hard and to fight. We have to perform the best we can and score goals and dedicate those goals to the people of Iran who are feeling hurt. I hope the situation will be as the people wish for it to be and that they will be happy. Uh. And now let's get to it. Another quick fire round of 30 seconds each, please. Tim uh, Melly or Tim uh, Mullah have Iranian uh, protests or anti-government protests reached total consensus. How universal is the support? Uh, Barbara, please take the lead. Well, I think a lot of people had mixed feelings uh, about uh, whether the team should participate at all. But mm. I thought the statement of the captain was, was really well done. And of course, they did not sing the national anthem. And uh, they lost, uh, embarrassingly, to England 6-2, yeah. uh, which might have reflected a lack of enthusiasm, I think, on the part of, of the Iranian team, not just that they were outmatched by, by the British. Um, but a lot of people had mixed feelings. You know, they love their team, uh, but of course, they hate what the government is doing. Yeah, um, between a place and a hard rock uh, to an extent. Uh, Benham, uh, your thoughts? 
Yeah, this gets to a larger fundamental cleavage that, you know, Iranians inside the country have felt and uh, Iranians in the diaspora have also felt, which is the fundamental tension between Iran and all that is good and affiliated with mm -hmm. Iran, the, the country, the culture, the civilization, and of course the Islamic Republic, the repressive authoritarian uh, Islamist apparatus that it is. Uh, and so, yeah, personally, you know, my, my view would have been it would have been ideal for the team to sit out the fight uh, rather than go into it and lose. But I think ultimately the fact that they did not sing the national anthem clearly put the whole team on the side of the Iranian people. But then again, this is not the first time soccer has become political, and you're likely to see more and more celebrities, more and more popular figures continue to use their voice and amplify yeah. uh, what the Iranian people are seeking on the streets. Mariam, uh, your thoughts? Uh, yes, just a few days uh, ago, the Team Meli uh, Team Meli players met with President Raisi, and even in the meeting, they bowed uh, to him. And because of this, they uh, were criticized severely uh, by the Iranian people. And so they got the message, mm. and what they've done game today is a reflection of that. Nevertheless, the Iranians who were in the stadium actually booed um, the uh, their own team. And when they lost uh, the match inside the country, people celebrated. So this is how uh, extraordinary times are in Iran today. Yes, and we're also seeing uh, some extraordinary uh, uh, scenes of uh, fans in Qatar outside uh, the uh, venue. Uh, um, truly remarkable there. And please, uh, let's feel free to respectfully uh, interact and stay on topic as much as uh, as we can, uh, uh, please. Uh, Benham, is there any other ending to uh, what is currently unfolding other than uh, regime reshuffle? Or uh, let me add a follow-up question. Is there anything the regime can do at this point in time to restore faith, uh, not by force? You know, there is something actually that the regime can do, the political, military, security, economic elite of the Islamic Republic, which is to respectfully step aside, to, to lack, for lack of a better word, to borrow from a phrase in history, uh, to actually hear the voice, you know, something that the late mm. Shah said, to hear the voice uh, of the Iranian revolution and to step aside if they had any shred of moral decency or if they professed to practice anything related to the faith that they preach. Uh, ultimately, that is not going to be the case. I think this is an Islamic Republic uh, that is born out of conflict, born out of chaos. They know they came through power in the streets. They will do anything possible to repress street power. And now they've amplified that to include taking their repressive apparatus into cyberspace to regionally and nationally subject the Iranian population to internet blackouts so that the messages cannot get out. I think things are destined to get worse before they get better. That is simply the nature of the Islamic Republic. It is not designed to make compromises, whether in its domestic policy or foreign and security policy. It's been four decades of relative consistency yeah. among two ultra hardline supreme leaders and those are titles meant to be taken rather literally uh, but whether these protests end tomorrow god forbid or whether they continue and they end up in a fundamental change of regime one thing is quite clear is that the trend of protests from 2017 to present show that the iranian people despite knowing that they're risking life and limb have not been afraid to turn out and they have not been afraid to turn out during peak periods of foreign pressure and they have not been afraid to turn out uh, in very awkward and tough times you know yeah. particularly with the the soccer game that mariam just mentioned where your state versus the regime uh, is at a fundamental crossroads. So, you know, hats off to them. And again, we should be taking our cues off from the streets. Yeah. And, and Miriam, in this respect, have we um, uh, uh, crossed the line between protest and a full-on revolution? Or where and when uh, w will this line uh, uh, be crossed? Can we mark this line even? I think we're in a revolutionary moment already. At what stage in the revolution we are is probably better determined um, after the fact. Once we have, once the revolution is victorious, we can know uh, where and when it started to have a tipping point. But really, this is a, a process of, of dissent that uh, started um, in late 2017, 2018. Uh, people came out onto the streets. And in November 2019, when they came out onto the streets in over 200 cities, the regime massacred over 1,500 uh, protesters. And just last week was the anniversary um, of those protests. And much, much more than in 2019, people are mobilized, they're aware, they're united. And again, it's very important. I can Keep coming back to this, their demand is very clear. It is for wholesale regime change. It is the it is the very demand that many lobbyists outside of the country have tried to 
uh, silence and say no instead yeah. of regime change reform and that's why people like Zarif and Larry Johnny and um, other uh, mm. you know uh, regime officials Just with great English what? reach out to uh, think tankers journalists and others in um, the Western I'm world to well, convince to them to be insulted by this no, uh, Barbara you know, please yes to have an ad hominem critique yes. on me for my 30 years of work on this topic, yeah. I will respectfully step down. The question is about whether Iran is in a revolutionary state. Would you like an answer to that question instead of a character assassination? Please, uh, Barbara, of course, the floor is yours, of course. Thank you. By the way, may I simply point out this woman took money from the Trump administration and used it to attack Iranian Americans, Lady, not the Iranian. Please, yes, anyway, please, Barbara. The please. question about whether there is a revolution is something that we will determine, obviously, in the future. But people have made their views very, very clear. And once again, and I agree with Benham, we should take our cues from the people in Iran and not from members of the diaspora with agendas. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Benham. Uh, concluding our remarks before we end up our discussion. Uh, well, ultimately, listen, uh, in terms of the phasing of what is going on on the street, I think at a bare minimum, analytically, we need to be able to say that these is, at, at a minimum, a pre-revolutionary, if not revolutionary phenomenon. Uh, that fundamental change from 2009 to 2017, that period is what brought us here. So critically, analytically, for historians, policymakers, Iran watchers, Iran experts, what have you, we need to know what happened from 2009 to 2017. And fundamentally, what I would offer is it was the failure of reform. It was the overpromise and under-delivery of the JCPOA, economic, political, social dividends. Uh, it was almost a decade of repressed labor strikes. Labor has been critical in getting the Iranian population out. And of course, fundamental demographic and population changes that have made the 2017 to present protests fundamentally revolutionary. And that's why their quest is indeed not reform. It is a wholesale change of government, as Mariam mentioned. Yes, well, uh, obviously an unfolding situation that brings up uh, a lot of emotion. Uh, out of uh, all those involved. Uh, thank you so very much uh, for being that uh, patient and, and sharing your insights with us uh, tonight, Barbara Slave and Ben Talablu and uh, Mariam Marsadegi. Thank you very much uh, for your time. We appreciate your time and your uh, insight.